monitoring, where I'm going to talk about um, what the company is doing in terms of surface movement monitoring, what our USP is, and then talk about three markets that we currently think are quite exciting and we're, we're currently moving on. Um, to introduce myself, um, I met a couple of you, but um, I've been, for 30 years, I've been working in synthetic aperture radar, so I'm surprised I've survived that long. Um, yeah, so I, I started off um, basically 14 years in commercial industry. I've worked in tropical forest monitoring. I've also worked in agricultural monitoring, um, the uh, set-aside project. I also used to work for the European Union. Um, but uh, then I joined the University of Nottingham as a lecturer in 2001. That has now finished and I'm now in the company full time. So, um, and having worked up a recent, um, say, innovation in interferometric SAR, um, we thought it was a good opportunity to spin it out into, and we convinced the guys at Innovation UK to give us some money for it. So that was all very good. Okay. Right, so the, the purpose of my presentation, or the, the goal of our, uh, of our USP, is to look at uh, ground motion, i.e. surface motion subsidence and also uplift. Um, as you're aware, there's plenty of different causes of ground motion, uh, both natural and anthropogenic. Um, and for quite some time, I think Earth observation data has been able to detect it and also we can interpret um, the Earth observation data in order to characterize it. Now, in terms of actually identifying small millimetric rates of ground motion, really it's uh, interferometric SAR that's capable of doing it. Now, interferometric SAR works um, using uh, the usual synthetic aperture radar signal, but this, uh, the technique uses the phase of the signal and from that it is able to de detect sort of uh, changes in position to an accuracy of better than one centimeter between any pair of images. If any of you know anything about GPS then the sort of RTK sort of thing works in a very similar manner. But it's a very common technique um, and say so this is it once it was a revolutionary technique used to monitor deformation around earthquakes and volcanoes, and it made the cover of Nature in, I think it was 1993. So it's already a, a very mature technique, and it's still being used in this sort of manner. And I just grabbed a, a headline there from the BBC website about the nuclear testing in North Korea, where they use differential interferometry from the satellite, from the Sentinel-1 satellite, to actually detect potential land motion related to that underground blast. So, still making the headlines, still a very good technique, still working. Uh, but that technique is very good for sudden large deformation, like you would get in an earthquake. In order to get the millimetric measurements, um, you really need to, we really need to analyze stacks of the data. So we need large amounts of data in order to remove things like the atmospheric uh, delay effect and, and, other, and other things. And from this, we can get actually a point velocity over the, uh, over the period of observations and also, un under certain circumstances, a time series. Uh, this is not a good te technique for looking at sudden displacement. So uh, this is really looking for long-term sort of deformation over long periods of time. Okay, so it's not a particularly good technique for looking at, for example, sinkholes, because sinkholes generally don't move slowly over time, they're, they're catastrophic. Okay, they're generally not so good at that. So I'm not, I'm not covering that sort of subsidence uh, in this presentation. So here's an example of what you can do with the technique and what's in all the, the brochures or the advertising. So this is a, a gas field in, um, the, in North Holland, just north of Amsterdam, near a, a town called Alkmaar. So this is the Bergmeer gas reservoirs. And you can see we've got colour-coded deformation there, where we've got plus or minus three millimetres per year. So red is subsidence and blue is uplift. Um, now what we're seeing here is when we compare it to the land cover classification, which we've got there, 
is that we're seeing we're generally able to see points over urban areas and hard targets, which is really how the technique has been developed over the last maybe 15, nearly 20 years since uh, Ferretti came up with persistent scatter interferometry paper in the late 90s. Um, so this is, a, this is a restriction. It's great if you're in a desert area. It's great if you want to look at urban areas, but if you want to look at deformation in um, in rural areas, it's, it's very difficult and obviously quite well advertised in the literature that this is a severe limitation of, um, of this technique. However, we've solved it. Okay? We can now make measurements over rural areas using a technique that we developed at the University of Nottingham that we're exploiting within the company. So this is the same, same result. You can see now we've got almost, almost ubiquitous measurements across the whole scene and across all of the forested and agricultural land classes as well as the urban land classes. Um, we have, we've chosen this site because there's a lot of um, levelling data. It was a test site for a project called Terra Firma. Um, so there was lots of levelling data taken in situ at the time of the satellite observations. Um, we've uh, submitted the paper uh, for publication but we're very happy that over urban and rural areas alike, we're able to measure subsidence to a root mean square error of around about one and a half millimetres per year over this site. So this is a game changer. We can now sort of monitor ubiquitous deformation over rural and urban land covers alike. Now here's just an example of what we can do. Because we get such a high density point, we can do wide area monitoring. So when I was at Nottingham, I had a student from Indonesia looking at deformation in the city of Bandung, which has deformation due to groundwater abstraction, quite a severe amount of deformation. But as you can see, we got uh, full coverage of the MVSAT image, so 100 kilometres by 100 kilometres area, which you generally can't using things like persistent scatterers interferometry. But we also got um, uh, uplift from an area um, just below a volcano there where there's a fault. Um, that was uh, validated by GPS data that was taken of that fault. So we were able to take, get the city-wide measurements, but also the rural sort of mixed vegetation that you have in the tropics of um, this deforming feature as well. Once more, we can also get uh, time series and that enabled us to look at uh, things like events, uh, make comparisons against events such as the earthquakes in the area to see how that would change. Um, how that would change. Um, but also, this student was interested in the basically how the deformation related to changes in groundwater level. Okay, which is something I'll come on to. Okay, um, so we've done validation. We've done contextual validation, also validation against GPS, and we've also just recently had a paper published on deformation in Mexico City using Sentinel-1. So we can bring the processing right up to date. So we're now not able to apply it to historical data, we can also apply it to current data. And you can see from this one, we've managed to extend the deformation over the whole uh, 250 kilometer wide swath which is what we have for uh, the Sentinel-1 uh, interferometric wide data set. Okay, so now we've got this capability, what can we do with it? Well, this is, a, uh, I think, a, 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 an image that I stole from another website. I think it's from the Trey website. Um, we basically have SAR data going back to the early 90s. So we have archives going back to the early 90s. Uh, and pushing forward, now this line should be over here somewhere with sentinels, uh, we now have, so we have an archive of data and we have a consistent, um, sustainable set of observations for the future as well. So now we can look at um, what that does for us in terms of being able to monitor subsidence and, and characterise subsidence over long periods of time. So I'm going to look at three different applications that we're currently looking at. Uh, potential markets for the company. Uh, first one is the regulation of shale gas operations in the UK. Um, the second one is infrastructure monitoring in Europe. 
and third one sort of follows on a little bit from the Resitec one, which is what this means, how this innovation would bring something to uh, measuring peatland, peatland recovery. Okay. So, so we now turn our attention, I showed you a nice image of, of Java, but if we turn our attention to an industrialised or a post-industrialised um, nation like the UK, um, this is characteristic of what we get over a lot of coal mining areas. So we've got the city of Nottingham there, Derby there, Leicester there, to give you an idea of the scale of the image. This is Envisat data from uh, 10 years ago. Uh, this is average deformation. So the blue is uplift, red is subsidence. Now what we see here is we're seeing a lot of uplift over former coal mining areas because the uh, coal mines were pumped, they were pumped to water, and once the, they were abandoned, the pumps were switched off, the rising groundwater gave a rise to, um, to uplift. So we see quite characteristic uplift over the former coal mining areas. We see it in Cannock, Cannock Chase, Swaddlingcote, Colville, uh, Hucknall, Alfreton, many of those areas there. We do see some subsidence relating to former areas of landfill, but I think the overall characteristics here is it, it's the coal mining that really dictates or demonstrates the, the deformation around in our areas. Um, if we zoomed in on the areas, we'd also, we've overlaid here the faults, the geological faults, the known geological faults, surface faults. We see this quite strong correlation to the uplift with geological faults. A good example of this is Canic Chase. We've got a nice fault running north-south there for maybe 10, 15 kilometers, and we can see very clearly that the uplift is bound by that fault. So there's a potential sort of potential fault under stress or releasing stress or whatever it is going on over those areas. And similar in, in Swaddling Cut and all over North Nottinghamshire. We see that all over the place. Now, if we do a comparison of data sets, um, we can see that this characteristics of the uplift is as we would expect. It's dynamic. It changes. Okay? It's not just a snapshot, that's it, like geology or something like that. It, you really need to be able to look at a time series of the deformation. So, on the left here, we've got uh, ERS data from the 1990s from Stoke-on-Trent. In Stoke-on-Trent at this time we got uplift from abandoned mines in the north and we got subsidence from actually still active mines in the south where they're still pumping water. So wind that on 20 years, the uplift appears to have been abated mostly in the north. We've still got some areas of uplift but strangely, we've got some blobs in the south that maybe, we haven't had it confirmed, but maybe due to groundwater abstraction um, in those areas. So we're getting a vision of quite a, a, dynamic, uh, a dynamic system in terms of subsidence in the UK or over areas of former coal mines. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... So we all should be aware of the consequences of that. There's, these are very small deformations, millimetres per year. So there's probably not much sort of that would worry you if you had some property going. But what's probably more worrying or more felt is the seismicity that goes with that. You're probably aware if you've been looking at the headlines that every so often there is a small earthquake at different places around the UK. And a lot of the time, they're in former coal mining areas. So there was a, quite a large one in Manchester at the beginning of the noughties. And uh, the most seismically active place in the UK is actually a place called New Ollerton in uh, Nottinghamshire, which is basically due to this mine water um, recovery, groundwater recovery, fault reactivation sort of system that we have going on. So this is important, so that the mines are related to subsidence, and they're also related to fault reactivation and potential seismicity. Now, so I did say at the start that I was going to talk about shale gas. Now, it just so happens 
that the main deposits of shale gas occur mostly in former coal mining areas. So this on the right here is a map of coal deposits in the UK, onshore and offshore. And this is a map of the actual licensing blocks that uh, DEC put out in the 14th round. And you can see there's very much, uh, in most of the cases, there's very much a coincidence between, uh, between the two. So, so we're potentially mining for shale, drilling for shale in areas that have a very high dynamics in terms of, in terms of subsidence, and there's potential uh, seismic issues as well. Now, if you were a, a household owner in one of these sites and suddenly they're fracking and you get a tremor in your building, is it due to the coal mine or is it due to the fracking operation? This is potentially something that, as an operator, you might like to know. And if you're a regulator, you also might like to know as well. So, and this is really how... Um, I think this is quite well publicised how um, fracking can cause seismicity. Um, I think I've had so much to do with BGS just lately. I know that I'm convinced now that they've convinced me now that fracking has no will have no in, impact on the subsidence around the wells. But since there was an incident at Priest Hall about five years ago, uh, where there was an earthquake. Uh, and it was caused by fracking fluids leaking into a fault and lubricating them, there is a potential for increased seismicity due to, due to fracking. So it's important to know where there are possible faults under stress. This, this only happens when the fault is already under stress. Now, basically, as I showed from an earlier slide, we can using this technique, looking at the subsidence, we can characterise the subsidence and we can also, through overlaying it with geological data, tell where there's potentially surface faults under stress. Now we can only see surface faults. The fault at Quadrilla was a hidden fault. We would not have seen it during this, using this technique, but we can see a subset of the faults, those that are at the surface, that are under stress. So we can tell this is one of the pedal license blocks uh, from the 14th round. So for example, we could tell a oil and gas company thinking that it's going to plant in there. We can give them a picture of the dynamics. We can give them indication as to whether there are stress faults. And this will be very useful information for them to show that they can mitigate it or to give to the regulator the planning authority to decide whether to actually drill in that site or not. So, um, I mentioned British Geological Survey. Uh, British Geological Survey have, have been helping us uh, to develop this capability. They've done a lot of assessments for us and they've also been doing assessments on behalf of uh, DEC. Um, this is a, a project that they're involved with looking at baselining in the Vale of Pickering, which is where the recent Kirby Mispeton site was, where they were granted a, a license, an exploratory license. Um, and they are currently assessing this capability to do the, um, the land subsidence baseline um, for, for DEC. So they we're looking at a historical baseline there, and we've now got an order to actually process Sentinel-1 data to look at the more recent dynamics. Okay. Okay, so, so that's the conclusions. We've got archive data enabling us to characterize deformation. Um, prior to any operations, we've got uh, Sentinel-1 data to take us right up to date and beyond. And currently, uh, this system is being appraised for uh, regulation of shale gas in the UK. So, okay, on to the next market. Well, obviously with, a, with subsidence, we're, we've got a potential for threats to infrastructure. Uh, the background map of this was actually a, um, from a paper where the British Geological, Soft, British Geological Survey used our software to look at deformation in the South Wales coal field. And we see this characteristic uplift due to mine abandonment. 
Uh, we also see lots of correspondence with um, faults, so we see fault bound, uh, fault bound activity, um, and I've overlaid on there the uh, the, net, the rail network onto that because there's a well documented case where they had fault reactivation caused by coal mining, and you can see the effect, the buckling effect, on the railway line there. So, so this is another potential application for this looking at uh, subsidence, looking at uh, in coal fields uh, where they might affect uh, the railways. Um, the software just looks at land motion. It doesn't matter what the cause of the land motion is. And in this case, um, we looked at, uh, this is um, a project with the University of Naples, where we looked at um, subside, uh, subsidence uh, landslides landslides in an area of, uh, in Italy where we have here a railway line and a road line running along the base of a hill where there's known uh, landslide events and we could see using the, this technique we get a very dense coverage and we can see where there's been land motion and potential threats um, to the infrastructure. So again these are looking at slow creep here, we're not looking at catastrophic landslides, we're looking at the potential for future problems with slow creep in these areas. Um, here's um, just showing the scale of what we can do. This is a, a subset of the, the area of Nottinghamshire. Um, this is a, another area that contains a Stoke-on-Trent result, but also contains Manchester, Lee and other areas. And you can see quite extensive uh, coal mining deformation uh, in that part of the UK and you can also see when we overlay the the main railway lines the potential to impact upon uh, uh, impact upon infrastructure okay okay that's just another slide where we we were also looking at the HS2 site where we were looking at profiles through the deformation and seeing how they corresponded uh, with different geologies um, we can also use the technique to look at other infrastructure, um, although using this technique we would never say that we can actually see a bridge structure itself. We can see potential threats, um, threats to the bridge structure on the shores. So I've just shown that we, I had a student looking at, um, looking at the, uh, the San Francisco Bay. Um, and there's a lot going on in this area. There's seismic stuff going on, but there's also groundwater abstraction. It's quite a busy, a busy image, and you can see there's a whole number of threats that could affect um, the stability of the Oakland Bay Bridge through differential motion on the on the banks um, of the uh, of the bridge. Uh, we're also involved uh, in a project looking at the Fourth Road Bridge. The Fourth Road Bridge is inherently much more stable. Um, but we're, we're basically uh, collaborating with a group who are putting GPS and other sensors on the bridge and seeing if we can work out some sort of synergy between the long-term deformation and the short-term sort of vibrational effects that they're able to pick up um, with GPS. So, um, and so for infrastructure monitoring, there's potential markets there. Uh, we are actually active in this. We are basically involved in two ESA integrated application projects, uh, one with, the, uh, with some Dutch companies, Structon and SkyGeo, and also Network Rail. And we're also looking at, as I mentioned, bridge monitoring uh, with a number of different companies, uh, also involving companies in China. So, okay, so that's infrastructure. Next, peatland. Well, um, I think, as has already been mentioned, peatlands are a very important area. Uh, they're important as a carbon sink or source. They're generally a very challenging area to monitor using conventional methods. Um, and um, it's also very challenging using conventional differential INSAR. Um, but we've had some success in this area with our new technique. Uh, this is an area, um, probably the largest area of open peatland in the UK. It's an area called the Flow Country in the very north of Scotland. Um, and this is very, very wild. 
not many sort of towns in here, but you can see using our technique, we can get almost complete coverage of the peatland. Now we've done an analysis of some of this area and we, I went up to this area and did some field work in May of this year and we saw that the drained peat is subsiding. So basically um, degraded peat is, is subsiding whereas uh, healthy peat is not. Healthy peat is fairly, is fairly stable. So where we see basically areas of red in that image where we've got subsidence, that's a potential indicator of degraded peat. So this, is, this shows some very good potential for using, um, for using this technique for monitoring the, the condition of peat. Um, we don't have much ground truth over that area, so there's another student at the moment who is looking at an area uh, near Venice in Italy uh, where there is some peat, uh, but also there's some ground truth, and we're go currently going through a validation uh, phase. Again, we can see the difference between degraded and healthy peat, but the, the deformation actual measurements, the actual amplitude of deformation, we're still having to fine-tune the method to get that, because the deformation that we get over peat can be many tens of centimetres a year, <coughs> rather than sort of a few millimetres like we get with, with coal mining. Um, so when I was up in Thurso on this, uh, doing this field work in the flow country, we also had uh, some experts in tropical peat and their interest is can we also see the subsidence in tropical peat, particularly where they, they do the deforestation and plant, and plant all palm, which involves draining the peat. Well, there's not much data over the tropics, but we've got this area of, of Johor in Malaysia, and we can see, just about, that we see a subsidence signature over the drain peatlands um, in, in Johor. Again, it's a very difficult area to work in. We haven't got a lot of data, but, um, but we should be, um, that does show some potential. So, um, so just to say, I know we're running short of time, I don't want to, I'll, I'll rush through some of this. So we can, identify degraded peat area we can and we can use that as a management tool um, if we're looking at greenhouse gases if we're looking at climate change and if we're looking at uh, release greenhouse gas release restoration to try and do carbon sequestration really that's what this is all about and as mentioned there is a market for this in terms of carbon trading so there is a proper commercial market in doing this as well as a as well as an environmental market so I just wanted to finish on some recent, just to show some recent work we've, coming from Thurso, I met somebody in Ireland and he said, well, they're having, they're trying to restore the bogs in Ireland. And he, this guy, he met his wife in Abbey Leaks and she was involved in the management of this, this bog here, tiny little bog, and say on our, this is Sentinel-1 data. Um, and we looked at Abbey Leaks and we said, well, at least with Sentinel-1, there's not a lot happening. There's maybe a bit of an uplift signal, but if it was, we're trying to get the historical data, if it was drained in the 90s, we should see a su subsidence signature there and see no signature here. So we've done half of the job with this in actually displaying to him that maybe the restoration is working. But we did a, a slightly larger area, and we looked at the condition of some of the other bogs. This is a highland bog, or a bog in the higher lands, and we can see potential drainage areas in the red here, very well correlated to the edges of the bog, so we felt that this showed basically contextually we're getting the right sort of information. But also in that image there was a couple of interesting bogs here where we get a strong, a strong uplift signal. Now that's quite interesting. Again, we're, we're doing this blind, there's not much levelling data ever taken over bogs because the bogs are very unstable. Um, but this could be, I've passed this around, and it could be due to lots of things. Um, somebody has suggested, well, it could be methane accumulation. could be all sorts of things. But it's a very interesting result. And as I say, contextually, it's, it's bound within the bog, and it looks very interesting. So... Just to say, we, for, in terms of the peatland areas, peatland areas have always been a challenge to monitor. 
the surface level or changes in the surface level using conventional techniques and conventional differential interferometry. Um, we've shown that this new technique, we've got a consistent capability to monitor subsidence over the peatland areas, and there's all sorts of applications relating to climate change, uh, carbon trading, and things like that for the peatland areas. And just to summarise, um, that basically our, we believe that our unique capability is really opening this up now. We can do more wide area applications, we can go into rural uh, rural settings, we can do larger, better characterization, characterization of the causes of deformation, the extent of deformation. Uh, I've already shown some example information, but I've also hopefully shown you that it's important to have these long-term data sets to be able to go into the archives in order to characterize the deformation from as far long ago as we can and compare it to what we're seeing now in order to properly identify the geological setting and also in some extent the geotechnical setting of the data. So thank you. Thank you very much.